Good morning Westview and welcome to worship. The men at work will be lovingly baking and serving freshly baked muffins at the 8am and the 10am services on Mother's Day next week. All ladies will be welcome to collect their muffins after the services. A very big thank you to those of you who have already responded to the appeal for KZN Flood Relief. The need however is still great, so please do have a look at our social media pages to find out where you can be of assistance and how you can help. The Morning WA will be selling sweet and savoury treats after all the services in May. As well as on Mother's Day, they will be selling Mother's Day gifts. Please do support their fundraising drive. Hello friends and welcome to worship on this first Sunday of May, which is Tithe Month at Westview. As we gather to worship, won't you listen to the words of Jesus as recorded in Matthew chapter 10. Jesus sends out the twelve with these instructions. He says, as you go, proclaim this message. The kingdom of heaven has come near. Freely you have received, freely give. Won't you join with me in prayer? Thank you, Jesus, for, for the reminder that in you the kingdom of heaven has come near to us. Thank you that you are nearer to us than the air that we breathe into our lungs. We praise you for the joy of living in your kingdom. As during this tithe month we explore what kingdom generosity looks like, may we experience the freedom that is found only in you. Amen. Give thanks with a grateful heart. Give thanks to the Holy One. Give thanks because He's given Jesus Christ, His Son, give thanks with a grateful heart, give thanks to the Holy One, give thanks because He's given Jesus Christ, His Son. Your generosity is extravagant, Jesus. Your grace and mercy so freely given. Your love and presence so readily available. Your spirit and strength so reliable. We are so grateful for all of these blessings that we enjoy and for the goodness they bring into our lives. We praise you for your always coming kingdom and the abundant life it offers. But Jesus, we're also fearful that your gifts may not be enough. 
that things may change and we may find ourselves in need. And so we hoard your goodness and separate ourselves from others. Let's spend a moment in silence as we offer our confession to God for any way in which we may be fearful of not having enough, any way we may hoard our goodness. And let's spend a moment in silence as we bring our confession. God, forgive us for our little faith and our selfish grasping. Forgive us for our failure to understand that your blessings are always meant to be shared. Teach us to stay always awake to your coming and always ready to invite others in to the blessings you so freely share with us. In Jesus' name. Amen. Friends, God has given God's self to us so freely and generously, and so we give thanks. And we also give ourselves to God in return. As Westview's banking details come up on screen, I invite you to make your offering as an act of worship and as an offering of all that you have and all that you are to God. Or you can spend some time in prayer now as you reflect on God's generosity to you and how you want to respond, and then you can make your offering at the end of the worship. Freely we have received. Now let's give freely, wholeheartedly, and cheerfully. Let us pray. Father God, I just want to say thank you for bringing us all together again on this, the second session of our tithe, uh, tithe preaching series. Father God, I just pray for <clears throat> just these tithes and offerings that will be brought forward, that they may just go to do your work, Father. Father, I also just like to pray that as we hear about this lesson today, that we may just give gracefully and joyfully, Father. Father, that we may be blessed as we give, Father, that we may not give begrudgingly, Father, that we may give, be giving cheerfully. Father God, pray this all in your holy name. Amen. Friends, our two scripture readings today come from the two uh, recorded letters that Paul wrote to the Christians in Corinth. The first one is from 1 Corinthians and the second one from 2 Corinthians. So we read first from 1 Corinthians chapter 16 and the first four verses of that chapter. Now about the collection for the Lord's people, do what I told the Galatian churches to do. On the first day of every week, each one of you should set aside a sum of money in keeping with your income, saving it up, so that when I come, no collections will have to be made. And then when I arrive, I will give letters of introduction to the men you approve and send them with your gift to Jerusalem. If it seems advisable for me to go also, they will accompany me. And then from 2 Corinthians chapter 9, and now we read from verse 6 through to verse 15. Paul writes, Remember this, whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly, and whoever sows generously will also reap generously. Each of you should give what you have decided in your heart to give, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. And God is able to bless you abundantly so that in all things, at all times, having all that you need, you will abound in every good work. As it is written, they have freely scattered their gifts to the poor. Their righteousness endures forever. Now he who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food will also supply and increase your store of seed and will enlarge the harvest of your righteousness. You will be enriched in every way, so that you can be generous on every occasion, and through us, your generosity will result in thanksgiving to God. This service that you perform is not only supplying the needs of the Lord's people, but is also overflowing in many expressions of thanks to God. Because of the service by which you have proved yourselves, others will praise God 
for the obedience that accompanies your confession of the gospel of Christ and for your generosity in sharing with them and with everyone else. And in their prayers for you, their hearts will go out to you because of the surpassing grace God has given you. Thanks be to God for his indescribable gift. We give thanks to God for this reading from Scripture. Well, last Sunday we uh, ex uh, introduced our uh, tithe month exploration of generosity by, by digging into a scripture that is almost 3,000 years old. Uh, we, we took a look at the fifth book of the Bible, at Deuteronomy, and we discovered three descriptions of what life-giving generosity looks like. Today we are traveling forward in time from, from, from that era, uh, about a thousand years, and we're traveling to a three-year period between the year 53 in the Common Era and the year 55 in the Common Era. It's, it's after Jesus' ascension and Pentecost, and the gospel has now spread out from the Mother Church in Jerusalem, and congregations have been planted throughout areas that today we call Turkey and Greece, and Italy. And, uh, and, and, and the mother church in Jerusalem from which the gospel first spread uh, for reasons that we not fully sure has, has hit hard times. Uh, many of the members of that church are facing severe poverty. Uh, there are several uh, speculations as to what might be behind the hard times that have hit the Jerusalem church. Maybe it's because of the persecution that they are facing in Jerusalem because they follow Jesus. And so they have been excluded from the economy of that city. Maybe their poverty is a result of, uh, of, of a, a, a surrounding culture which shunned those who are poor, blaming them for their poverty. But the Christian church embraced all people regardless of how rich or poor they are. And so it may be that they've attracted many people to their membership who are themselves poor. And this is the cause of them having a lot of poor people amongst themselves. Maybe it's because their experiment in, in sharing common goods that we read about in Acts chapter 2. Maybe they were so busy focusing on dividing up the pie equally that they neglected the growth of the pie. They neglected looking at, uh, at the businesses that they were running. And so maybe that's the reason why they've hit on hard times. Whatever the reason, and, and we can't be 100% sure what it is, Paul becomes aware of the dire situation facing the Jerusalem Christians when he visited Jerusalem. And, and, and their need touched him deeply. And so Paul, in addition to being the chief evangelist of the early church, uh, he also becomes the chief fundraiser for a special fund that he launches uh, to help the Christians in Jerusalem. And Paul makes his appeal to several, several different congregations, not just in Corinth, but also in Galatia and in a few other places. And uh, he makes this appeal through the letters that he writes to them. And not only does he appeal to them to give generously to this fund, but he also gives them specific instructions in how they should give, similar to the instructions that we found in Deuteronomy last week. What I find really interesting is that, is that the three guidelines for generous giving that we discovered last week from Deuteronomy, those same three guidelines are present in Paul's writing to the Christians in Corinth. Do you remember how Deuteronomy taught us about giving joyfully? Well, uh, Paul writes in 2 Corinthians 9 verse 7 that God loves a cheerful giver. And do you remember how Deuteronomy taught us about giving from our first fruits, not our leftovers? Well, Paul instructs the Corinthian believers that they should set aside money on the first day of every week. And then where Deuteronomy talk about, uh, spoke about proportional giving, Paul writes that, that money should be set aside in keeping with their income. And so what we discover here is that the guidelines for giving that we discovered last week, that they are timeless guidelines, that they are universal guidelines, that they apply to the ancient farming community of Israel, uh, they apply to the urbanized believers in the city of Corinth, and they apply also to you and I in 21st century South Africa or, or whatever country you're worshipping from and living in today. 
So today I'd like us to go further than those three guidelines and introduce you to two further guidelines for giving that come to us from Paul's uh, two letters to the Christians in Corinth. And, and like the three guidelines that I've just uh, uh, spoken about or recapped, uh, these truths are also universal and timeless. So the first uh, new guideline for giving that I'd like to introduce today is this, that we, we give regularly. We give regularly. Last weekend, I was talking to Alex, who is studying towards his BCom degree in Cape Town. And I asked him how his work was going. He said to me, Dad, the volume of, of work that I've got to get through at university is just, it's almost overwhelming. And I'm learning very quickly that the only way that I'm going to pass uh, my degree is to set aside time every day after my lectures to go over the work that we have covered that day. He said, if I, if I leave it until the weekend, I'm going to fall behind. If I skip even one day, I'm going to fall behind and I'm going to struggle to catch up. Uh, if I leave it until I have an exam or a test and then try and cram, he said, I'm going to come horribly short. He said, I'm learning that the secret uh, for me to pass this year is to work regularly. That, that some time spent every day will accumulate into the amount of time that I need to give in order to get my degree. And, you know, I was thinking about uh, how Alex's realization that regular commitment to something uh, is the path to achieving something significant to life. And I was thinking about how this applies in so many different areas of our lives, doesn't it? I, I still remember um, 20 uh, or 30 years ago now, um, the, the, the first time that I, I ran the, the Comrades Marathon. And I remember the first time I drove by car from, from Peter Maritzburg to Durban down the N3 with the Comrades Marathon in mind and thinking, how on earth is it possible for a person to, to cover this distance running, 91 kilometers running in under 11 hours. Surely that's impossible. Uh, it's impossible to achieve. But yet we know that every year, uh, thousands upon thousands of people uh, are able to cover that distance. And how do they do it? Well, they start with a, a, probably a 12-month training program. And the training program is about spending time every day on the road. Maybe they're going to start walking, then they'll move on to running short distances and then move on to uh, longer distances and longer distances. There's no cramming for the Comrades Marathon. That's never going to work. Training happens by putting in regular time every day. And by doing that, a huge amount is achieved, ultimately being able to run an ultra marathon in the required time. And, uh, and, and, and so we discover that, that most of the significant things in life that we achieve are achieved through a commitment to doing them regularly. And it's the same with giving. Uh, so Paul writes to the Corinthian Christians and he says, he said, do what I told the, the Galatian churches to do. On the first day of every week, each one of you should set aside a sum of money. On the first day of every week, each one of you should set aside a sum of money. You see, Paul knows that, that the needs of the Jerusalem church, that they will be effectively met not through flash in the pan kind of one-off appeals for assistance. That's only going to provide short-term help. Instead, it's, it's regular giving that sustains God's work for the, for the long haul. Every month when when I received the financial reports from uh, Leander in our church office, um, uh, and she sends them through to Sapiwe, myself, and to the finance committee, and I look over them, I'm always humbled and amazed um, that, that uh, over 450,000 rand a month of operational costs of Westview, that they, they are covered by, by scores of people like yourself who have made a commitment to give regularly, uh, so, that, uh, so that the lights can remain on, uh, ESCOM notwithstanding, uh, but more than that, so that, so that Westview can continue to be a place where, where lives are changed by the power of God's Holy Spirit working through this congregation. And it happens through the regular giving of the followers of Jesus Christ. We give regularly. 
A second guideline for life-giving generosity that comes to us from Paul's appeal to the Corinthian Christians is this. Uh, we give without coercion. We give without coercion. Paul writes this in verse 7. He says, each of you should give what you have decided in your hearts to give, not reluctantly or under compulsion. You know, it, it would have been the easiest thing in the world for, for Paul to guilt the Christians in Corinth into giving towards their sisters and brothers in Jerusalem. Paul could have said to them, hey guys, uh, the Jerusalem church is where it all began. Without them, you would not exist. You owe it to them to, to give generously. Or Paul could have said to them, you Corinthians live in an affluent city. Uh, you have no idea how rich you are compared to those Christians in Jerusalem. Uh, how can you sleep at night knowing that you are, uh, are in, in comfort while they are in need? You, you better dig deep. But Paul refuses to guilt the Corinthian Christians into giving. Instead, what, what Paul does is he invites them. And he invites them to give what they have decided in their hearts to give. So when the Bible talks about the heart, it is that point where, where thoughts and emotions and spirit and will all come together in one place. And so when Paul says that we must give what we have decided in our hearts to give, he's inviting us to, to really think about how much we ought to be giving. He's inviting us to, to pray and to seek God's guidance, the guidance of the Holy Spirit, about the, the level at which God is calling us to give. And not only do we, we consult God, if, if we are running a household together with a partner, then we consult with that partner as well uh, to, to decide the level at which we are called to give. And, and, so, uh, and so as we give, we are always checking the motivation behind our giving, checking that we are not giving because our arms have been twisted, checking that we are not giving because we have been guilted into giving, checking that we are not giving because we want to appear generous towards somebody else. Our giving is an exercise of our free will, uh, given in response to the God who first gave himself to us in Jesus. We, we give regularly and we give without coercion. Friends, I want to pull this all together with an illustration from the world of nature. If, if you take a look at the, the map of Israel, uh, you'll see that there are two uh, main bodies of water in Israel. There is the, the Sea of Galilee and there is the Dead Sea. And they are joined by the Jordan River. The Jordan River begins way up in the north to the north of the Sea of Galilee. It flows into the Sea of Galilee to the north, out the south end of the Sea of Galilee, and then it flows down and joins the Dead Sea. There is one important difference between the Sea of Galilee to the north and the Dead Sea to the south. The Sea of Galilee is teeming with life, uh, but the, sea of, uh, the Dead Sea to the south is unable to sustain any life whatsoever. That is why it's called the Dead Sea. And the reason for this is that is that the, the Sea of Galilee has an outflow. Uh, water flows out of the south of the Sea of Galilee uh, down towards the Dead Sea. The Dead Sea, because it sits below sea level, only has an inflow from the Jordan River, but it has no outflow. And so the water there stagnates, it evaporates, it becomes more and more salty over time, and that is why it is unable to sustain any life. And friend, that's, friends, that's a reminder to you and I of two different ways of living. You and I can live lives of generosity whereby as we have freely received, we freely give towards God and towards others. And as we do so, we will be like that Sea of Galilee, bringing life uh, not just to our own beings, but to those around about us. Or we can, we can hold on to our stuff. And when we do so, we become like the Dead Sea unable to sustain life. My prayer for you is that you, uh, is that you, as you follow your design purpose, for you are created in the image of a generous God, that as you follow your design purpose, that you will come alive by the power of the Spirit and give life to those around about you. Now let's pray together. Generous God, who has given us the gift of life and has given us the gift of salvation in Jesus. 
we come before you acknowledging that we have been made in your image and we have been wired to live generously. And so, Lord God, I pray that, that we, each one, will live our lives in such a way that your life flows through us into the lives of other people and into the world in which we live. We offer ourselves to be used for your glory. Amen. Thanks so much for helping us to enrich our lives through giving generously, regularly and freely. Friends, as we respond to what we've heard and received today, let's consider what it means for us to give regularly and freely. If you have a coin or a note of money, I invite you to hold it in your hands now. Think about what that money means to you and what its role is in your life. Think about your relationship with your money and how easy it is for you to give a proportion of your finances away. Give thanks for the money you have and for being in a position where you are able to give. I'll give you a moment to do this in silence. And now I invite you to think about giving regularly. Are you already able to do this or has this been a challenge for you? What can you manage as a regular offering? How can you be more intentionally regular in your giving? And then think about what it means for you to give freely. Is there any sense of coercion or pressure for you around giving? Is there any guilt associated with your money and your giving? And if so, I invite you to take a deep breath. And as you breathe out, release these feelings of guilt and pressure. And now think about what you can give freely, what you are able to give joyfully without any negative feelings. I'll give you a moment to think about that now. And finally, I invite you to think about how you can bring these insights into your practice of giving in the weeks and months ahead. It may be a good idea to carry these thoughts into this week and give yourself time to work it all out. And now let's offer ourselves to God again as we sing.
Now, friends, as we end this time of worship, let's speak the words of blessing over one another as a gift of love. Now, may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all evermore. Amen. And now we go into this week filled by God's generous self-giving and ready to be generous with others in Christ's name. Thank you for sharing this time of worship with us. Have a wonderful week. And God bless you.